Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure, coming to you from Waikiki Beach. It's been beautiful here in Waikiki. It's the time of the South Swells. It's the beginning of the South Swells. If you've read my my new book that just came out, uh, the uh, A Surfer's Guide to the Soul, it's kind of based on the, the four different seasons of surfing. And uh, this is the time of the South Swell that's coming up. And in Waikiki, that means surfs comes up and... There's been, I think in one day, we had 380 rescues, ocean rescues out here. 20-foot surf, just beautiful. And I'm being so distracted looking out my window, looking at the, the surf coming. But um, uh, we want to invite people, come to, come to our Deep Adventure Quest. Come, come join us for our retreat. It's always around, the, around December 7th for, uh, for a three-day retreat. Come and stay for a while. We have as our guest today, Dr. Aaron Henderson from Broken Arrow. Oklahoma. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. It's been an amazing time for us right now in America. We're seeing a little bit of a cracking open of maybe a little bit more freedom to speak. And we're also seeing uh, perhaps this big change coming on with the, with the su Supreme Court decision. This is the time for you to pray. It's also the time for you to have a voice. Uh, we don't, we, you know, I, I don't think God really likes nice guys too much. I've been introduced several times to people. Uh, men introduce me to their wives. This is Bear Wozniak. He's a really nice guy. And I go, no, I'm not. Anyone who knows me knows I'm not. <laughs> it can be a little bit tough when we're on the road filming Long Ride Home, for example. And they'll insist that I'm a nice guy. And I'll go, no, 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 I, I'm not a nice guy. I hope to be a good man. And good is a very powerful word because Jesus said only God is good. Being good is to really fulfill uh, it, from a philosophical point of view, the nature that God gave me, not just as a human being made in his image and likeness, but just kind of the nature that he imprinted on me in, in the very unique gifts and callings that he has for each of us. And so we don't want to pursue being nice. There's too much niceness around. It's time to, uh, you know, there's no one who can speak so eloquently and with clarity than a Catholic. Sometimes I'll hear people being interviewed in, on secular radio and I go, oh, that person's a Catholic. Just the language they use and the way they think and the way they speak and with such clarity. So that's why we have our guest on today. He's going to help us understand um, a little bit about Catholic faith and culture. And you know, Dr. Aaron Henderson, he's with the Alquin uh, Institute for, cul for, uh, for Catholic culture or for culture? For Catholic culture, that's right, Bear. Yeah. So, so, so Aaron, the very word culture has the word cult in it, which means all cultures have, culture itself kind of emanates from a religious uh, an upward yearning that we all have. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, you know, when we get together as human beings, and that's what we're meant to, to do, to be together, right? We're ultimately supposed to worship God. So you're exactly right to make that connection. That's awesome. We're talking with Dr. Aaron Henderson. Uh, he, was in, he was introduced to me by... Um, uh, the guys who have the Catholic Man Show, Adam and David, and and even though they recommended him, I thought, well, I'll have him on my show anyway. But we're, <laughs> we're, we're so glad to be here. If if you watch, you know, you listen to EWTN probably, but if you if you go to our our website, deepadventure.com, and subscribe to our email newsletters, or go to the YouTube Bear Wasn't Deep Adventure YouTube, you get to see this guy's cool beard. So, what's the story about the beard? Oh well, t to be honest, I've uh, you know all throughout grad school and so forth, I kind of had it very short. And I thought, you know, I don't know what it's going to look like when I grow it out. Maybe it'll be bad. Maybe, you know, you got these awkward intermittent stages where it just looks kind of scraggly. And so I thought, you know, when I got here to, to Tulsa, to Broken Arrow, I thought, you know, these other guys, these other cool guys I respect, not Adam. He doesn't have a beard. But oh, We don't uh, Richard, respect him either, but go ahead. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, but Richard Malosh, uh, I work with him and, and Joey Spencer and these other guys I work with, they have these, these nice beards. And I thought, well, you know. 
heck with it. I'm just going to grow it out, and, and here we are, for better or for worse. Well, are you going to go early church fathers on it, ZZ Top it, or are you going to hang out right where it is right now? Well, I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to see what my fiancé thinks about that, but I think that uh, for now, I'll just, just kind of leave it how it is. I used to work for a big four CPA firm, and they go, we don't mind you having a beard, just don't grow it on company time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about your background, because where, you where you are right now, I'm so jealous of that, that you get to do what you're doing right now, that you're, you're able to go deep into philosophy and theology. And I'm looking yeah. at the bookshelf behind you. Just turn around and tell me about three or four of those books that, 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 that you just love. Yeah, so, uh, for example, there's one here by... Thomas Joseph White, have you? I don't know if you've had him on your show. He's a Dominican. He's now at the Angelicum in Rome. Wow! But this guy's the real deal. He is. He is one. Of, you know, maybe one of the best theologians in the world today. A, a Thomist, uh, and he writes this book on Christ, right? On Christology, the study of yeah. Christ. And this thing is a is is a masterpiece. Um, I, don't you just love those? Yeah, give me another one. Yeah, I've I've got some. It, it tells uh, me a lot about you because these are your friends. Yeah, you know, when well, you this, when you read a book, you you become friends with that author. That's right. Yeah. So this is a book that I had since I was a you know a teenager. When I was a teenager, getting into the faith, Scott Hahn was of course very influential for me. So this is Hail Holy Queen. So he's got of course tons of good works. Um, I've heard of him. No, it was his right. book on it was his book on the Eucharist and Stephen Ray's book Crossing the Tiber that brought me back to the Catholic Church. Oh, wonderful. So, yeah. Yeah, a, yeah. So give us How one about, more. Uh, here we go. How about Aristotle? This is a good... Oh, I've heard of him too. Yeah, you know, uh, some people have heard of him. But, you know, these someone like Aristotle, he's just so foundational for for um, Western civilization, right? And so he needs to be recovered, I think. And so, Aquinas was kind of a fan of guy. his. Kind of a fan, a little, yeah, little that's right. A bit of a fan. He that's always, what I've heard. I always, I, I, when I first was reading uh, his, his uh, Summa, I was like, the, as the philosopher says, and I'm like, well, what, what, what philosopher? Yeah, who, who I mean, the heck I, I wasn't. Guy? I wasn't like I took it at college. I was just reading it myself, and then I had to course, yeah. take the background courses. And of course, he was quoting Aristotle. That's so, right. So let's let's backtrack a little bit. I just that tells me a lot about you. You know, the books that I have behind me. It's so funny. I was interviewed once by a, a talk show, and they go, "Oh, we really like your backdrop." And I go, well, "Those are actual books back." <laughs> <laughs> there, you know. Yeah, you know what they are. Tell me what those are. You probably know. Yeah, so we've got the, I guess on your right shoulder, we've got the, the church fathers there. So and the other I one think is so, right? Yeah, and the other the other one, one is, is the is that the commentary on scripture? I assume the by the early church fathers. The early church father commentary. So so the church so, fathers are obviously very important for you. Well, so, yeah. well, so we have friends in common. The early we fathers, do. and you know, the, the problem with early church fathers is they're always plagiarizing me. Right <laughs> when I right. come up, right when I come up with something smart, I go, I read and I go, oh yeah, they already said that. <laughs> yeah, it, isn't that crazy? And 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 life in general, you think you have this this brilliant insight, you know, you think you're the first one to say something, and you know, it humbles you to know the fact that no, someone's already thought of this, and probably better than you did, or better than I did, you know. So well, you know, but the, maybe you know, not you. It, it, but it me. is so cool. I was with uh, one of the guys, Tony Orban, in our TV show, Long Ride Home, you know, the motorcycle show, uh -huh. and he said it. He said, whenever you have a question, there's someone a lot smarter than you <laughs> and more spiritual than you. That's already addressed that topic, and yeah, uh, and we right. and so many of the nuances of the of the of the early fathers, and and of course, uh, and of course, your love of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, yeah. So be before we go that way, though, I want to I want to hear about um, two two things I want to hear about. First of all, is your uh, your early walk with the Lord. We got a we we got a few minutes before the break. Just tell us a little bit about how you became this guy sitting surrounded by these books. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I grew up in a in a pretty non-Catholic area, maybe even a little anti-Catholic. So I grew up in southeastern Missouri, and you know, right in the middle of the Bible Belt, a lot of Protestants everywhere. Uh, and so, um, especially when I went to high school, I went to a public high school. That's when I really started to realize that I need to figure out why my faith says the things it says, right? I need to have the reasons for my faith and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I dove into scripture. That's when I dove into the church fathers like you did. It's when I dove into St. Thomas. 
And I think the most compelling thing for me as a teenager was knowing that the things I knew naturally, the natural truths I knew about the world, about myself and about God, they weren't undermined by faith and by grace mm. when they came on the scene, but perfected and lifted up. And I, I thought that was profound and beautiful. And I was kind of on fire. I wanted to share that richness with the rest of the world, you know. It's so cool. You know, we, I, I, you know, we, we think Elon Musk is so smart, and he is super yeah. intelligent. Albert Einstein, super intelligent. Until you've sat down with Aquinas, you've never, you, you don't know what intelligent is. He yeah, always, I, I, I agree. Tell us about the Aquinas way, about how he asks a question and the, the way he approaches. For, yeah. And the summa is for the beginner, right? It is, yeah. Supposedly. It's, 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 a, it's a summary <laughs> of theology and it's for beginners, right? But, you know, that presupposes knowing your Aristotle and knowing your church fathers like Augustine and others. But yeah, when St. Thomas approaches the problem, like in the Summa, he has a general question, some big topic that he wants to answer. And then he has articles, like more specific questions. And then he starts off with objections. You know, what are the best people saying against this position? And then he says, well, on the contrary, we have this authority like Augustine or like Aristotle. And then finally, he gives his position, right? What's called the respondio. I well, answer that. And he just goes for it, you know, gives let's, his let's take Let's on come the back and talk about that when we, when we take this break. We're talking with, awesome. we're talking with Dr. Isn't that cool, dude? Dr. It is, it Aaron is Henderson. Cool. He's with the Alcuin Institute for Catholic Culture. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. This is Dan LeBoon Markham with another episode of Country Up, Buckaroo. What brand do folks put on you? No doubt some good and some bad. Lots of terms for cowboys, cow hand, cow poke, cow puncher, ranch hand, herder, brush popper, never heard that one, did you? And buckaroo. Was a time in Arizona when cowpokes resisted being called cowboys due to the outlaw gang known as the Cowboys, who notoriously tussled with Wyatt Earp, his brothers, and Doc Holliday. From dime novels, the popularity of rodeos, and Hollywood producing western movies, the term cowboy rose to the top and stuck. I do admit having a personal liking for Buckaroo it has a certain feel when you pronounce it with a sort of wholesome tune when you get to the Roo and Buckaroo. Herders were multi-ethnic. Most trail drivers were veterans of the Civil War, Confederate, and Union, with somewhere in the neighborhood of 25% being freed slaves. Others were European immigrants, Mexicans, and American Indians. Christianity is indeed multi-ethnic. Bible types called by a number of names, some good and some not so good. Essentially, Christian means little anointed ones or followers of Christ. We've been called hypocrites, fundies, Bible bashers, hateful, and so on. Sometimes deserved, sometimes not. Not to worry. The key is following and imitating Christ in word and deed. Jesus said we would be known by the fruit we bear. Hopefully our fruit looks wholesome to others because, well, it, it is wholesome. Keep in mind, though, our fruit will be ultimately judged by Christ alone, not others nor our culture. This is Daniel the Boone Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. Now you can journey with other men in the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue and servant leadership through Bears Man Cave non-Facebook community and our three-year school of manliness video, audio, and written content, as well as self-assessments help you to chart your new course. Join us at deepadventure.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite you to, um, to join... Uh, Bears Man Cave in the School of Manliness. You can go to deepadventure.com to do that. We have Zoom meetups 
once a month with the entire man cave. And then once a month, you have a, a smaller Zoom meetup with just your group of men that encourage you and challenge you and you pray for each other. You, you share your kind of hold my beer moments in a, in a, a non-Facebook type community uh, that we have at our website. And then also there's 36 months in the school of manliness. And we as men, as the whole group, we go through each of those together. So wherever you start, if you start with us on year one, month three, that's where you, you jump into the curriculum with us. But what's happening now is the men are getting username and passwords for their sons that are like confirmation age or older, and they're going through the three years with their sons. The sons get to go through the curriculum. They don't get to be part of the man cave, that's for adults, but the sons go through the curriculum. And, and it's so, so cool because they'll click on, 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 on the virtue of prudence. And then there's a, there's a, 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 a writing by me uh, on that. There's a, a, a homily by cowboy priest Father Bryce Lundgren. There's another two-minute thing from Daniel Markham on, on the, 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 the man up guy. And there's, there's just different, all kinds of different things. But you can actually track your sons as they click off everything that they've done. And so you can, inter, you can have a weekly uh, time with your son uh, going through, the, through Bear's School of Manliness. And by the way, it's based on, um, on uh, your two friends at the Catholic Man Show, Adam and David. There's no more manly, manly men than those guys. That's right. Yeah, no, they're the real deal. Nothing like having a cigar and a, and, a, and a manly beverage with them. That's right. Okay, so we're talking about Thomas Aquinas. This is what I dig about Thomas Aquinas. And we so much need to have this today, this mindset. He would propose, he would ask the question. Mm -hmm. Then he would give the two or three best wrong answers. And yeah. he'd present them as best as he could. Yeah, th and, that's a really good point because, you know, we talk about like straw man arguments, but he right. steel manned his, his opponent, right? He tried to make them as strong as possible. Right. And so today you an don't see. Point. And then he said, on the contrary, and he would quote mm -hmm. scripture or quote, quote a early church father or someone. And then he would give his response and then he would get or his the correct answer. And yeah. then he would give the three. Uh, he would he would then counter the, the three earlier yeah. statements that were erroneous. That doesn't happen anymore. Like when you hear the so-called, when they'll have a news story and there's a one for the pro and con on either side, they're just throwing out sound bites and trashing each other and lying about each other's positions. And we, yeah. we, we need to have rational, we need to respect one another enough to listen, have a rational dialogue. Yeah, that's right. And that means that for someone like St. Thomas, the truth is the highest thing in his life, right? And he's going to go after that no matter what the cost. And that's really what the saints do, not just St. Thomas, but others. They're seeking out the truth and they're willing to suffer and even to die in the case of the martyrs for the truth. Yeah, I, lo I, I, just, love, I just love him. He was called the, the dumb ox, right, when he was young. That's right. Mm -hmm. Why did they call him that? Well, you know, it's funny because originally people thought he might not have been too bright, you know, and it's funny. There are things about him, certain quirks that I find interesting, like his handwriting, for instance, you can look at some of his, his handwriting and it's atrocious, horrible, you know. That's why and, he had uh, scribes when he wrote. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> he and, you know, He'd have four scribes and, at a time. He would say one sentence, one sentence, one sentence, one sentence, go back to the original guy, right? That's right. It's crazy. And he was he was a very large man, too, not because of, you know, any intemperance in eating or anything. He probably had something wrong with, I don't know, his thyroid or pituitary gland. I don't know. But he was very large. They I mean, the 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 story is at least they had to kind of carve out a special desk for him so he could sit. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, to kind of round but nevertheless, it out so he could get in closer. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But I mean, this is a mind like no other, like you said, because he realizes that he's not doing it alone, but he's taking from Aristotle and from Augustine and from the scriptures. He's right. standing on the on the on the shoulders of giants, as they say. Right. Right. So he's synthesizing all this stuff and uh, delivering it for the glory of God. That's what he's doing. That's his, that's his purpose. Should people be scared of picking up the Summa? I, I don't think so. And I know that sounds, you know, who's this? theologian guy you know he thinks that it's it's easy but it's it's not necessarily easy but when you learn how to read him and, and the way you were talking right. about we were talking about you know you understand how he works and how he thinks then i think when you do that and you read slowly and in a contemplative way right contemplative way like one article a day helps. one it's article two, a day two or three pages you know? peter crave yeah. has a great book out the summa of the summa it's a great it introduces you to what you're getting yourself into but people are afraid of the cat catechism too just, they are just you know some people like like my wife she likes a good steak if you want something really nice and chewy 
read a little Thomas Aquinas. Read a little of G.K. Chesterton, you know. Yeah, but I really right. recommend you read Peter Crave's book, The Summa of the Summa, because it lets you know what certain words mean and how he uses them, and mm-hmm. and and it kind of get kind of gets you rolling. But 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 we need uh, we need people that speak over our heads, that are speak too too smart for us, so that we can stretch and grow and learn. Yeah, yeah, and I I think too, Bear. There's there's a there's an idea nowadays that you know what can a 13th century Guy yeah, I teach, I used teach to think me. like that. Yeah, you know, and and <laughs> and it's almost understandable why people think that because he's so far removed from our time time and circumstances. But when you realize that truth doesn't change, and that ultimately, of course, truth is a person, Christ, right? That that allows you to learn from these great figures of the past, whether Chesterton, more proximate to our own time, or someone like Saint Thomas. Well, think about this. You know, the the, the, the these great, wonderful philosophers of the Enlightenment. You know, they mm-hmm. threw out the past. Yeah. Right? Oh, we don't need that. We've got a new way of thinking, and it was it was, it just re, it just has it's it's the whole it's the beginning of the woke culture to some degree the beginning of the of of the socialist communist you know dictator type of of of, of attitude uh-huh. that took place. What we're just going to throw out the past and we're going to start fresh. Reminds me a little bit of the Pope. Uh, what was a Pope Leo, Re- Revum Novarum. You yeah, know, Pope he, Leo the Thirteenth. New That's things, right. new things. No, mm-hmm. this is the ancient of age, Jesus That's Christ, right. the the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah, and and you miss you mentioned uh, Chesterton too, isn't his his phrase that, you know, we tend to fall into a kind of chronological snobbery. Is that I think he? He's I don't remember that. that. What what did he say? Well, he talks about how as moderns we tend, like you're saying, to reject the past and to think that we're kind of in this position of superiority, we are moral and intellectual. And so we have this snobbery, right? We're snobs yeah, for about sure. the past. So I think that I think that's definitely true and it's, no, that, it's dangerous. That was me, dude. My dad introduced me to the liturgy of the hour. This is before yeah. I returned to the to to the church and I would and I would do some of the prayers. But then I would start to quote the office of readings and maybe some you know, some people that are older than 100 years from now, you know, yeah. I thought, well, why bother reading that? I'm serious. Yeah. And then I found that's the real treasure, is those those very writings. It's the first place I go now when I do my liturgy. I go right to the Office of Readings. I make sure I get that in every day. That's what, beautiful. You, now, I, I have another question for you. Um, why didn't you pull out Tolkien's writings over there? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, you know, I could have pulled out others, too. You know, I, I wouldn't say these are the only books that but kind the of only, If you're a man who, who wants to translate, yeah, I bet you have a love for Tolkien. Tolkien. Yeah, he, he was a profound, not only a profound mind, but like you said, a profound translator, you know, as we're thinking about. Uh, so we're going to be teaching these great books courses over the summer. Myself I want to go. The, yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> it would be it would be a great time, you know, and um so as we're looking at these these various works, you know, I, I keep coming across things that Tolkien translated and so forth, and yeah. it's just it's just it's just wonderful. So I'm I'm you know nowhere near him, and I'm kind of just a baby translator, right? But I'm trying to put my foot in the water, right, to see what it's like, and and ultimately I'm a theologian, so I want my translating to serve my study of God, if you want to put it that way. Well, you know, uh, we're going to talk more about this when we get back, more about Tolkien, about translations, and. Uh, yeah. and, and you know the one thing about translators is I think our very the one we think about uh, uh, one of our original translators of course was Jerome That's and right. I have a friend Jason Jones that says he knows he has a chance to get to heaven because he know he knew Jerome had kind of a a Serbic sort of <laughs> he did, attitude he did. but he goes if he can become a saint then I can become one too we're talking with uh, uh, Dr. Aaron Henderson from the Alquin Institute for Catholic Culture what website can they find find you at yeah, so they can find it, find us at alquininstitute.org. So alquin is a l c u i n institute.org. We're we're talking with uh, Dr. Aaron Henderson. You should see him, you guys. He's got the coolest beard and the greatest greatest books <laughs> in the background. And uh, so if they if they want to attend the great books this summer, can they do that online or do you do that in person? Well, we kind of we're kind of serving the the people of the diocese. So for now, we don't have a kind of online format. Maybe in the future, that's something we could do. Uh, but we're you hoping will. to have people here. Yeah, uh, hopefully we will. You know the Catholic way: not either or, but both and. That's right, both, both and. and. That's right. Um, we're, we're talking with Dr. Uh, uh, Aaron Henderson from uh, the 
Alquin Inst Institute for Catholic Culture in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be back with more. This is Bear Wozniak with the Deep Adventure Moment coming to you from my home in Waikiki Beach. People here in Hawaii, we say aloha and people think aloha means hello and aloha means goodbye, but actually aloha means to give breath. If you're here in the islands and you're not from Hawaii, they say you're a haole. Haole means to have no breath. When Captain Cook came, he shook the hands of the islanders, the first non-Hawaiian they'd ever seen. In Hawaii, though, we know we bend our head foreheads together and we nose breathe and we share breath. And so we say aloha. We share breath, the breath of life with each other. You remember what Jesus said? My peace I give you. My peace I leave with you. And he breathed his Holy Spirit. Can you imagine? He breathed his breath and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Let the breath of God aloha you. How do you do that? You have to get quiet. You have to get still. It can't be Elijah, remember in his cave, he heard the big wind, the lightning, boulders crashing, but Jesus came to him, God came to him. The Holy Spirit came to him in the stillness and in the quietness. Learn to be still, learn to be quiet. For me, I have ADHD to the max, as we say in Hawaii. For me to be still is actually to paddle on my stand-up paddleboard or take a long walk on the beach. But when I do that, I pray. When I'm on my paddleboard, uh, I'm praying the rosary. When I'm walking along the beach, I may be listening to sacred, a sacred book or the, doing the liturgy of the hours. But learn to be still. Let the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. This is Bear Wozniak from deepadventure.com. Aloha. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul. Both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on Amazon.com. Hey, if you haven't been to the Bear Wozniak deepadventure.com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books, and since I'm a Benedictine oblate, we have the St. Benedict exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too, plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our deepadventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you want to find the perfect gift. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. We have as our guest today uh, Aaron, Dr. Aaron Henderson from the Alquin Institute for Catholic Culture. And we're talking about words. You know, one of the, you know, can you imagine Tolkien? being just so thrilled with words. Beca mm -hmm. beca he, he said things like, every word is rich with history. Yeah. And I remember as a young kid, I think I was in seventh grade, I was exposed to a class on the history, I guess it's etymology, would that be the right word? That, that we've tracked the history of words. Yeah, that's and right. So many were Latin words, and then it was, so this, this word, be, started out as this word and it gradually evolved to, to being said mm -hmm. now and it used to mean this and now it means that. Here's the thing, Aaron. Satan shows up right off the bat in Genesis and he twists God's word. Yeah, he does. And we're seeing that today. It, Tolkien was very protective of words, not to misuse them. And we see that today with this, with this culture of death, you know, planned parenthood. What mm -hmm. it sounds like such a good thing, yeah. You know, it so does. much, so much of the liberal agenda. They very good at taking words, twisting their meaning, to make it sound just so tasty and so good. I, I think that's right. I mean, even even you know, terms like abortion is a kind of, you know, better way of putting it, 
right? Instead of the killing of the unborn or something like that, or, you know, uh, oh, you know, the, the, the fetus wasn't brought to term. You know, we use all these things to kind of inoculate ourselves and to numb ourselves perhaps to the reality of these things. And that, that's not good. Like you said, we need to remember what words mean, right? And they have a cultural significance to them as well. So the English language, you know, it's kind of a mix of Latin and Greek and French and all these things. And it has a, it has a history, right? And words have meaning. So whether we're being compelled to say something, which is not good, or we're kind of losing sight of what words actually mean, that's not a good thing, right? We're losing our culture. We're losing our Christian heritage when we do those kinds of things. And, and, and the logos, you know, the, the rhema. That's right. Uh, spoken by the Sophia, you know, so mm -hmm. spoken by the second person of the Holy Trinity. Um, and God said, let there be light. I mean, words, words are full of power, full of power. Yeah. And, and Jesus is the word. Yeah, so it's it's like Benedict the Sixteenth says in his famous Regensburg lecture, right? That Christianity is fundamentally we're a people of the logos, right? Of of reason and of the word, right? So that, like I said before, what was so compelling to me as a teenager that when faith and grace come on the scene, they don't undermine what we know by reason, but purify it and lift it up. That's what the Christian faith is about, right? We're uh, we're offering this rational worship to God and we're always doing it in spirit and truth. And so uh, that's really something that sets Christianity apart, right? We're people fundamentally of the word, the eternal word and reason of God. We, he's given us a spiritual, rational soul. And so there mm -hmm. was, there is that, there is that, uh, there was a, uh, there's a basic question. Do we obey God's commandments because God said so, or do we obey them because they're good? If God said something, I mean, so be, be, because of this this uh, heresy that we have, our souls were depraved, and there's yeah. no good within us, and and then we th this is the, uh, this Protestant teaching from Luther, I guess, it, mm -hmm. uh, that that then we uh, then we obey God not because of that it's good or r bad or good because we just don't obey God because He said it, but it's really yeah. more than that, isn't it? What what is what is good? Yeah, that's a really good point, because what you're highlighting with people like Luther and some of the other reformers, they're imbibing what you might call a kind of voluntarism, where God simply imposes his will on the world and we obey it, right? We don't know if it's good or true or beautiful, but we're going to obey it. But that's not the Catholic vision, right? So God um, is a kind of moral lawgiver, yes, but the, the goods that we pursue in this world kind of come forth from God's own goodness, right? God himself is good, and he's the cause of all the good things in the world. He's the, he's the giver of every good gift. And so that's kind of how the Catholic sees it, not as this voluntarist thing, not as just an imposition of will, but we seek out the good because ultimately it leads us to God. I, I made a mistake when I was younger. My kids would I always ask that question, why? Mm -hmm. And I thought it was important for me to tell them because I said so, because I wanted them oh, to understand yeah. authority. Yeah. But um, I think I think I could have done both because I said so, because I'm the authority in your life. But here's why I say it. Yeah. I never finished that second part to understand, to help them understand this is the, the rational reason behind you know what we're doing. Yeah, well, I, th I think that's a great point because, you know, think about the purpose of law. Like, the uh, purpose of law is to make men just. And so sometimes it really sets restrictions so that people don't hurt one another in society. But if you stop at law and don't actually teach people and change people's hearts, right, the heart of the nation, for instance, law is only going to do so much. So, like, you're talking about abortion law, for instance. Not only do we need laws that outlaw abortion, maybe, but we need to change people's hearts and minds. Those two have to go together. I think that's really important. Yeah, people, I'm not a political person. Um, I definitely have my strong views. Yeah. But people say, you got to bring up this topic. you got to bring up this topic. You have to have, to have this guy on your show. And I, I'll, I'll tell them I don't speak to politics. Yeah. Um, I, I wish more of my listeners would would join and become a congressman or s school council, school board yeah. members or count or city council members. But I speak to what you know. What is the moral truth? I, I will engage yeah. people, you know, at that level. My friend Jason Jones. I keep bringing him up because I interviewed him yesterday. He has a uh, his organization is called called Movie to Movement. He's the one that was behind the great. Uh, some of the great films like Bala, and mm. he says that because, the, and going back to your the whole thing of uh, the Alcuin Institute for Catholic Culture, 
yeah. that you don't change in law isn't going to change things. You need to change the culture. Give us a little bit of background about the vision between, between behind the institute and your uh, uh, why you why it has the name that it has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in 2018, uh, the the bishop here, Bishop David Condorla, he kind of put forward this pastoral plan for the diocese. And one of one element of this was this institute to kind of reform education and culture in the diocese. And I know this term, you know, this this name Alcuin is probably foreign to a lot of people, but he was this great cultural and educational reformer under Emperor Charlemagne. So we're talking oh, about the birth of the Holy yeah, Roman Empire, yeah. right, in the, in the year 800. He's the one that said, we need to educate our people. That's exactly right. So he did, so he kind of had a three-pronged approach, if you want me to talk about that. Did you that say super three important. prongs? Three, that's right, three-pronged three okay. approach. So the first thing he did, he actually stocked the forests of Europe with boar and deer. And that sounds kind of crazy. Really? Cause w why would he do that? Right. It served a practical purpose because they needed brushes from the boar's hair to write with and they needed the vellum to write on. So for educational purposes, but also he wanted people to have this kind of poetic contact with reality to get mm. outside like you do all the time with surfing and climbing and you know all these things and to be in contact with reality. Alcuin knew how important that was for healing people because nature has this tendency to heal. And then the second thing he did was open these institutes of learning that copied these great ancient texts, some of which were in danger of being lost during these periods. Of and what year was this? So this is around the year 800. So the Holy Roman Empire kind of emerges at that time, and Charlemagne sets uh, Alcuin in charge of reforming a lot of the empire. And so, so what, why uh, this but, doesn't make sense because it's supposed to be the Dark Ages. They weren't supposed to be smart. That's 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 right. They were just, you know, living in caves and grunting and stuff, you know, <laughs> but um, so so that was the second thing he did copying these ancient texts. And then finally, he knew that learning always takes place in the context of friendships. And so we try mm. to kind of bring all these things together at the Institute. So real learning, real friendship, real living. Those are the kind of ways we imbibe Alcuin's vision. So we're trying to restore Catholic culture here in the diocese, just like Alcuin did on a larger scale all those years ago. That's and the idea. What are the, what are the great books you're going to be uh, going through this summer? Yeah, that's a good question. So these are like intensive courses. So the first one is Greco-Roman classics. So we're reading things like the Odyssey and reading things like uh, Cicero and Plato and, you know, those kinds of Beautiful. things. Yeah, it's, it's good, really good stuff. And then for the medieval, we're reading things like Dante's Inferno. And oh, man, that, I just went through yeah. all of Dante's well, Divine I mean, Comedy. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I read through everything, the, all three yeah. volumes. And then I read commentaries as I went through. I love what a Anthony Anselin has done with those. Yeah, yeah. We're probably, we're, we're trying to go, we're going back and forth. We're probably going to use his translation for the Inferno. He's got a really good poetic style. He's, he's a good, and he's he a loves good Italian. translator. He loves he Italian. He does, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you're going to go through Dante's Inferno and what else? Yeah, and we're going to read uh, Sir Gawain in the Green Knight. We're going to read some St. Thomas. We're going to read... Um, Oh, St. Gregory the Great has a work mm. on the life of St. Benedict. So we're going to read yeah. all these various works and, and, and really kind of show, hopefully, the students this beautiful Catholic vision of the world and, you know, uh, what right. Western civilization is all about. Well, it, well, there's a book out. I forget who wrote it, but it's called How Cap the Catholic Church Formed Western Civilization. We're talking yes. with um, Dr. Aaron, Dr. Ph.D., Aaron <laughs> Henderson with the Alcuin Institute for Catholic Culture. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. We invite our mama bears to join our non-Facebook community created just for you, to share the journey with each other and to take the self-guided one-year course on the Virtues Plus. You have free access to all of the Long Ride Home TV show, all of the Bear Wozniak video version of our radio show, 
plus the Catechism in a Year videos, all at deepadventure.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I want to tell you about two really hardworking men. My sons, Joshua and Shane, are the two that are really the, the, the work behind our uh, reality TV show, which we won two tally awards for, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. There's nothing tougher than being on a long ride home shoot because we don't have a budget. It's all pretty much based on donation. And... Uh, and we have volunteer men riding with us, and then we have maybe a dozen, 10 to 12 people that are part of the, the film crew and the support crew, and we're rolling thunder, filming the whole time we're rolling, and also when we stop, because that's when stuff happens. We're, so the film is always rolling, and every day we have a half a terabyte of data. And of course, I write it and I host it. Um, it's on EWTN on Thursday nights. Season one, two, and three are up right now. Uh, but also, you can watch it on Prime Video, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak, or you can go to deepadventure.com and you can join either the Mama Bears or you can bear, join the Bears School of Manliness there. And you get all the episodes so you can kind of secretly turn it on when you have a friend that you really want to lead to the Lord is at your house. Watch a motorcycle show and pretty soon uh, talking about Jesus in a real practical, gritty way. Going deep, though. And, and guess what? We're, we're editing right now the Hawaii episodes. We've got about three seasons, we think, here in Hawaii. We, we, you know, God really let us. We filmed about five more seasons that have aired right, than have aired right now. And we did all that just before COVID. So we had the same group of writers, and, uh, and I, it was just so cool. So we have all that in the can, and now we're working so hard to get it out. Go to deepadventure.com and join, and then you can have access to all of the seasons airing on EWTN. Plus, every time we get a new one done, we send you the rough cut. You get to see it before EWTN sees it, and then they say, well, change this and change that. So go to deepadventure.com, become a mama bear, become a member of the Man Cave and Bear School of Manliness. And because my sons have done incredible work, we meet every every morning. We meet uh, the same time to kind of say, what, what, how are we pushing this rock up the hill a little bit further? So. Um, it's a it's a real call of the Lord on their lives, and uh, you will really uh, real really be blessed by it. We're talking with Dr. Aaron Henderson, PhD in what? So I got a PhD in systematic theology from Ave Maria University. So down theology, in uh, Naples, down in Naples, Florida. That's exactly really? right. Really, so be- beautiful place, beautiful campus. I was just down uh, there. Uh, my sister has a, uh, a winter home down there. She's oh really? She and her husband. Yeah, yeah we, I was just I didn't get to I've been to Ave Maria once, but I didn't get that far. I just dodged in there for a few nights to see my sister. Yeah, so southwestern Florida, not far from Naples, a uh, beautiful place. What what the heck is systematic theology? Well, it's kind of hard to explain. It's if you think of historical theology, it's like okay, you might study people in the fourth or fifth century. You know, you might study Augustine or Saint John Chrysostom or whomever. But with systematic theology, it's more like you're taking a certain truth or set of truths and seeing how they make sense and how they relate to other things. So like uh, I showed you Thomas Joseph White's book on Christology, right? Christology is the study of Christ, obviously. You have ecclesiology, the study of the church, all these different things. And so you might study these truths of the faith, their kind of inner meaning and intelligibility and how they relate to other things. And you, I don't and know if that makes sense, but that's kind also, of what you do. And you also go along the historical path of how it was developed. Yeah, you know, there's some historical stuff, but I would say that systematic theology is is also heavily philosophical, which I really love. Yeah, me too. I always wonder, why philosophy? You know, um, why do priests first spend three years being formed in philosophy? Why philosophy? I mean, just all you need to know is the Bible. Well, if you really yeah. want to know Scripture, it was written by a, a being that's rational, God. Uh-huh. And, you, and knowing how to think is a huge benefit when you, when you, you don't dissect Scripture. It should dissect you. It's the sword yeah. of the Spirit. 
Uh, but how to how to with in a real sacred look pick up scripture and understand it. So I really I really dig on it. What was the what what was your favorite one of your favorite areas that you studied then? Well, I, my thing has always been the relationship between nature and grace. So really? human nature and God's gift to us. You know, I've always been like, you know, how do how do we account for that? You know, how do we make sure that we we account for the fact that His gift to us is free? You know, He doesn't have to give us grace. He doesn't have to all give us life. these things are. <laughs> he doesn't have to give us life. So all yeah. these things have have been super uh, important for me, but especially that. And I also studied the church a little bit. Um, all kinds of stuff, but especially really nature and grace. It really gives you hope when you study the church because you can go through there and go, wow, they really screwed up, or that was a horrible pope, or that was terrible what happened. Yeah. And yet the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I will build my church. And you can yeah. see no matter how the test of time goes, it always remains, it always comes back to yeah, that's Christ. right. We have the we have the whole testimony of the Old Testament where the Jewish people again and again go against God. They harden their hearts. They're stiff-necked people, and some people think, oh, you know, again, this this chronological snobbery. We're so much better than they are. Sorry, newsflash, we're actually not. Yeah, you they're know? smarter than. They're, 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 we've been dumbed down. There's no yeah, question. Probably, yeah. They are a lot smarter people. But you think of that in the Old Testament. You know how. Not they had this beautiful covenant with God, and then there's this one scripture verse that says, and they found the ancient scriptures. They found the ancient scrolls. They had even lost yes. the the Bible. I think it was, was That's Josiah. Right. They had the whole. Yeah, th exactly. This was after the time of the Babylonian exile. That's right. They find the scriptures and they read them aloud, and people weep. You know, they finally they've rediscovered their tradition. You know, which Praise is so beautiful. God. Praise yeah. God. So we, we, I agree with you. And I, I mean, you read Augustine, you're like, oh, this should be interesting. And then all of a sudden, he's talking about the nature of time. Which, by the way, I was listening to last night a scientific, uh, you know, YouTube video on the nature yeah. of time. They didn't quite figure it out either. I mean, just it, I mean, he'll go. He goes into so many different areas, not just, you know, it, but it all comes back to the wonder of, of God. Mm -hmm. So I want to know, have you have you translated Tolkien's? I, I, I forgot to ask you that. earlier. Have you tried to translate Tolkien? You know, he has his own language. Oh no 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 no! So that, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that's what I do. I mean, there's a place for that. That's pretty cool. I've mostly translated Latin and French, so okay. that's kind of what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay. So so, I, I always thought I'd love it to to have a foreign language till I till I took one, and they said they started talking about parsing and adverbs, and, uh -huh. and I yeah. thought, oh, is that? No, I can't even do that in English. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, it's it's not always easy, and you kind of have to have to understand. You've got to get in the in the mind of the the person writing. You know, you've got to understand the culture. You've got to understand the language, the vocabulary that they use, because that develops, like you were talking about earlier. So, um, but I think it's a beautiful thing, and so I, I've translated a couple, just a couple things. Like yeah, tell I said, us. I'm a baby, tell us, baby translator. So the the thing I did recently was okay. So there was a there was a cardinal in the 20th century named Charles Jornet. And he was a great scholar on St. Thomas, and really? particularly St. Thomas on the church, ah. his ecclesiology. Ah. And so I translated this article from Jornet where he's talking about the mystery of sacramentality. So think wow. of how central that is to us as Catholics, right? right. The mystery of, of Christ's sacramentality, right? His, his humanity mediates to us his, his, his divine life, right? Uh, the sacramentality of the church. The Second Vatican Council talks about the church as a sacrament, the sign and instrument of God's salvation. And finally, the of course, the sacramentality of the seven ecclesial mysteries, the seven sacramental mysteries that we receive throughout our lives as Catholics. And so he has this awesome article on that. And I thought, this is too good to be left in French. You know, we need to get it to people in really? English. So, so you were the first to, to translate it into English. Well, as far as I know, yeah, and, and I, it's been accepted for publication, so we'll see. But it's one of those things like you're always a little nervous. I've tr I'm translating being, this thing. I've, yeah, is, so it's going to be published as a, as a, um, uh, academic document. Yeah, k kind of as like it was originally published as an article, so it will be published as another article. And I wrote like well, an send, send me a link to, to it. Text. I'd love to read it. That's just so cool. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful. Uh, uh, really, if people are teaching about the sacraments, especially his his section on the sacraments is huge, and it would be super useful to uh, to all kinds of. And people. don't you find when you're when you're doing that work, like I, I'm sure when in your studies you translated some of the Bible and you had to yeah. pra practice that, but you know we I have a a book I can't reach it. It's on my other desk called uh it's 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 so cool it's it's the it's the 
New Testament translated into Hawaiian pidgin. So it's oh, not wow. Hawaiian language, it's pidgin. Yeah. And when you read That's it... That's unique. Yeah, and so it's an actual translation. It's not a paraphrase. It's meant to be a translation. And when you read it, like, let me give you an example, John 3.16. Mm-hmm. For, so, uh, for God so aloha the world that he gave his one and only boy that would, whoever, whoever would believe in him would have life to the max. So oh, that's wow, that pigeon, yeah. that pigeon flavor. Yeah. But when you translate it, you get to go deeper. Hey, we're already out of time. Uh, we're, we've been talking with Dr. Aaron Henderson, doctor, PhD in systematic theology uh, from the Alquin Institute of Catholic Culture. Uh, where can they find you again? So, uh, yeah, you can find me at uh, alquininstitute.org. Yeah, check out, especially if you're in the Oklahoma area. By the way, ask your bishop to have me come back out and speak to the men's conference again. Yeah, why? that'd be awesome. You know why? I have a cigar with the Catholic Man Show, guys. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> They'd be happy to see you. Well, this is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Thank you for joining us. As we say, you know, the word aloha in Hawaiian means to give breath, which is what God did in Genesis when he breathed a life-giving, uh, uh, became, man became a life uh, uh a living soul, and also when Jesus said, My peace I give you, my peace I leave with you, and he breathed his spirit. So may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha! Hey, if you haven't been to the Bear Wozniak DeepAdventure.com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books, and since I'm a Benedictine oblate, we have the St. Benedict Exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too, plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our deepadventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you want to find the perfect gift.